we actually believe that technology can make the world a better place. I have to ask the question, like, how do we do this? How do we solve these problems? It seems that AI has the potential to actually solve um, a lot of the problems we face. Hi, I'm Anton. And I'm Jeff. We are building Chroma. Which is memory for AI. This idea of AI has permeated science fiction since basically day one. I mean, golden age science fiction, like Asimov, has tons of like the positronic brain and these great robots that do stuff for us, and then we have weird moral conundrums about them. I've been working with neural networks ever since 2005. Like my undergrad capstone project was using convolutional neural networks for image compression. I found myself thinking like, what do I really want to work on? What's important to me? And then I thought back to that work that I had been doing. This is civilization important and this is one of the things that I'm pretty sure I can work on and pretty much ever since then I've just been all in on this whole space robotics AI machine learning everything this new primitive which is a, a reasoning machine in a box allows us to do things that we could not do before you know the question then becomes well how do we make these reasoning machines reliable interpretable um, and how do we teach them things so they can go and solve problems reliably this is the uh main office where the team works. All the Diet Coke you could possibly need to conquer the world. That's how you can tell we're serious. I have to kill a horse. Who's killing horses with Diet Coke? You can think of AI as a machine that has two functions, right? It's a machine that remembers and it's a machine that reasons. The stuff that an AI model remembers is encoded into its weights as part of its training process, and so is its ability to reason. So in order to bring it new information or information that it didn't have during its training process, you need a way to basically have that information available to the model so that it can reason about that information. And that's basically what Chroma does. Chroma brings the most relevant data to AI for it to perform a particular task or answer a particular query. So we are essentially the database for AI. One, one advisor of ours made the statement that retrieval is the key to AGI. If we can solve this problem of retrieval, and if we can do a great job of it, all these other problems become uh, solvable. So Chroma today uh, is known for two things. It's known for our in-memory and single node product. In-memory means you can run Chroma inside a Jupyter notebook, inside a Python script, as trivially as import ChromaDB. And the single node product is like you would think. You can run it as a database on your computer, and you can write and read to it. There is a research paper out uh, using Chroma, it's called Voyager. This is a bot that basically learns to play Minecraft and it remembers and memorizes skills that it learned on the course of that and stores those skills in Chroma. It uses Chroma as its memory. The other interesting part of this is not only does the bot kind of wander around Minecraft and learn things on its own, but humans can teach it. And humans can teach it just by adding skills to that programmable memory that it has. It can learn on its own, you can teach it, you can modify the memories it has, you can modify what skills it's using. Directly under the hood, how it works is a user puts in a prompt. The question then becomes, what information is relevant and needs to be in the context window to maximize the chance that this AI system, this language model, can accomplish the task? One way to think about this is basically things that have the same vibe uh, are near each other in this map. You know, what is my company's time off policy uh, would be a point in space. And that point in space would be close to points that are talking about vacation policy or close to points that are talking about holiday policy. So this ability to do fuzzy search with embeddings is an incredibly powerful tool for information retrieval. This is actually a pretty difficult problem to get right. We're actually building the entire memory stack for AI. Making retrieval robust and just work out of the box is critical for making AI actually work. Not just for application developers, but for like ordinary people using these applications. And what we want to do is free people building AI applications from worrying about how they get memory to work. And that is a really challenging problem that unlocks so much potential for actually building these technologies. This is my favorite question to ask co-founders, but what's your guys' favorite and least favorite thing about working with each other? <laughs> you can start. I've been answering all the other questions so far. <laughs> <laughs> How many founder breakups has this question caused? I think that... Uh, so far, none. I think it's therapeutic. <laughs> I think that Anton is usually right, and so uh, that's kind of nice, right? Uh, Damn. You, you, have, you have good judgment. Let's see, the worst thing... It's like a Hillary Clinton answer, right? Like, you're too nice or something It's like going to be a Hillary Clinton answer. Um, Come on, I can take it. <laughs> you're not the best at punctuality, but that's okay. Fair. That's, okay. that's fair. I'll take that's, that. That's not really the worst thing. I was just, I'll you know, take that. It was a, you know, PG-13. PG the best thing with working with Jeff is we're very complimentary in skill set and also attitude. Jeff is often more cautious where I'm more aggressive. 
And that leads to actual real discussions around decision making. It means that we'll like dig in rather than just going on vibes. And I think that, that has allowed us to make really good decisions. Least favorite thing of working with Jeff? Sometimes he talks too fast. I don't know what he's saying. Skill issue. <laughs> Listen faster. Most of the conversations that Jeff and I have had have been around like theory of startups. I think there's a few core things. Hiring and culture are probably the number one most important thing that you have to focus on. As founders, like our operating theory is actually culture is upstream of literally everything else. Culture defines what your company is capable of doing. And that means that you have to choose the people that you work with very carefully. The way that we put it in shorthand is we want to work with adults. People that we can be confident in to carry out the task who don't flake, who if they don't succeed, understand why success didn't happen. Chroma has pivoted twice before arriving on the product that we're building today. I wouldn't use the word pivoted. Well, I guess not pivot. The way that I describe it is we knew what country mattered and we explicitly tested beachheads to find the beachhead that would be the best. And one thing that we committed to with Chroma was we're gonna do what we think of as serial deep experiments. We're gonna pick a target, have a concrete hypothesis, do our best to reach that hypothesis and then evaluate whether we succeeded or not. Taking that very seriously is quite important. A lot of the modern startup wisdom is a little too heavy on just find product market fit, be like a cockroach. The best scenario, you have a happy accident. We don't want our lives and we don't want this company to be an accident. And the only other alternative to things being an accident is trying to be very thoughtful. I think ultimately founder taste is underrated. One way or another, it always influences what your company actually does, whether you acknowledge it or not. Like the way that I like to phrase this, there's no metrics dashboard that takes Apollo to the moon. You cannot make Saturn go, you know, a thousand feet higher every day until you reach the moon. You have to figure out how to get to the moon. The next big milestones for us are two things. Right now, we are building a distributed version of Chroma. So this is a cloud native scale out database. That means you could run Chroma not just on one computer, but on you know tens, hundreds, or thousands of computers at the same time. It allows our customers to scale uh, Chroma to be very large size. That allows us to offer a hosted product. Developers have been asking us to build a hosted version of Chroma. The meme internally has been when hosting, uh, W-E-N, hosted. Hosting a database is not something that most people want to do, and we think we can do a really good job of it. Technology doesn't matter if people can't use it. You should never have to think about the tool that you're using more than the task that you're trying to perform. And I think that attitude really drives how we think about this product. And making a tool that gets out of people's way unlocks their ability to actually build things on top of it. Building something that's easy to use, it's more than a convenience thing. It un like it shifts attention away from the difficult to use thing onto the actual difficult problem that you want to solve with AI. We have a genuine chance to unlock a lot more of the potential of this technology than is available today just by making it easier to get going. I think it's a commitment to our goals and our values. You know, we want to see technology enter the real world and improve the real world. It is not enough to make it functional. We also have to make it beautiful and aesthetically appealing. It is easy to build hard things, but it is hard to build easy things. And ultimately, we've realized that I think developer experience is incredibly important. Maybe that comes from us just like not being smart enough to uh, handle the complexity of really complex things and be okay with it. Anton and I always are like, no, oh, this is too fancy. This is not easy enough. Yeah, I'm certainly incredibly frustrated by almost all software. Almost all software is bad. Um, and I want to make good software. We have this sort of cultural value of wanting to, I guess, to some degree, like, you know, make magic and be a part of a team that's like making something magical. You know, the thing about magic is that it can't be taken too seriously. You have to have some fun along the way. I think what Anton and Jeff are building with Chroma is amazing because they have this very long-term view about the AI space. When I asked Anton what book I should read this week for the episode, he suggested Software, which is sort of like a biography about Larry Ellison and, and the foundation of Oracle. I think what's easy to forget about Oracle and Larry Ellison is how none of that really existed at the time and how a lot of trends sort of repeat. There was this, this idea of cloud, this idea of a data layer, this idea of, of, of SaaS really didn't exist. On the one hand, you think, Wow, they're, they're, they're a really visionary team, much like Anton and Jeff are with Chroma. And then you can also think too, like, wow, history repeats itself a lot, especially in tech, which is interesting. Aside from that, Ellison's ambition is kind of like inspiring, terrifying, a mix of both. It's definitely an interesting read. I'm not fully done with it yet. But I think it's interesting that Anton suggested that that is the book I should read for this episode. So I wanna take a second to talk to you about a problem I've been having. An S3 episode kind of in a vat, in a silo is 
good, but it's a very committed thing to watch. And honestly, what makes them really interesting is if you have a ton of context on the problem, the founder, the background of the company. And as a result of that, I have decided to do something which is a little kind of uh, not exactly something I would ever consider doing, which is starting a podcast. I've been very intentional about not having the episode content cross over with the podcast content. So you can watch both or one or the other and you'll have a completely novel experience. You're not just gonna get like chroma in podcast form. And if I can just let people talk and talk and talk and give all that context in a fireside chat sort of format, I think that's a really exciting experience as the show goes on and as we can like better tell the stories of the startups and the vision of these founders. I'm a little nervous and very excited about actually uploading S3 episodes on Saturdays and a brand new podcast adding a ton of context in what I think is just genuinely some of the most interesting, highest insight per minute content I've seen on the internet. As always, thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. And until then, keep on building the future.